Hollywood, California, Monday, February 22nd. The Lux Radio Theater presents Errol Flynn and Olivia de Havilland in Captain Blood with Basil Rathbun, Henry Stevenson, and Donald Crisp. Our stars, Errol Flynn, Olivia de Havilland, Basil Rathbone, Henry Stevenson, and Donald Chris. Our guests, Charles Courtney, underwater treasure seeker, and Douglas McLean, famous star of Silent Day. Our conductor, Mr. Lois Sobers. Our producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille, is deep in the bios of Louisiana, working on his next picture, The Buccaneer. Until his return next Monday night, it is our privilege to bring you again one of Motion Picture's great personalities. And an old friend, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Herbert Marshall. So do the makers of Lux Toilet Soap welcome you to another hour in Hollywood. Now, a word to the ladies. If you've noticed lately that your shoulders, neck, and back are not as lovely as you'd like them to be, as soft and clear as the skin on your face, then ask yourself this. Are you giving them the very best of care? You probably use Lux Toilet Soap as a complexion soap. Do you use it as a bath soap, too? Lux Toilet Soap's active lather goes deep down into the pores, removes perspiration, every last trace of dust and dirt, keeps neck and back and shoulders smooth. For a quick pick-me-up and to protect daintiness, make Lux Toilet Soap your daily beauty bath. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Good evening, everyone. Many years ago, off the coast of Louisiana, there sailed a pirate named Jean Lafitte, a strange combination of plunderer and patriot, and who one day, pinched by remorse perhaps, or by a sudden thirsting for new adventure, presented his cutthroats to Andrew Jackson, and thereby brought victory to the United States in the Battle of New Orleans. Tonight, Lafitte claims another British victim, and his name is Herbert Marshall. Lafitte, you see, is the subject of Mr. DeMille's next picture. And right now, he's down among the bayous, following the trail of the buccaneer. He asked me here, so here I am, walking the plank with trembling step and quaking heart, but very thankful that next week, Mr. DeMille will bring back to the Lux Theater of radio, and I, once again, will be able to resume the peaceful obscurity of a listener in. Our story tonight concerns another pirate, Captain Blood, with Errol Flynn in the title role. Born in Ireland, a descendant of Fletcher Christian, who led the historical mutiny on the bounty, Errol's old adventures in the South Seas, before he turned actor, read like a page of strangest fiction. Signed by Warner Brothers, he made his first Hollywood success in tonight's story. And his latest film is Greenlight. When Olivia de Havilland appeared here last fall, Mr. DeMille told you how Hollywood changed her plans to become a schoolteacher and overnight made her a brilliant new star. She, too, appeared in Captain Blood and tonight resumes her role of Arabella. Lovely, unspoiled... And with a talent belying her youth, we'll see her shortly and call it a day. With three other good friends in our cast, being here is something of a reunion for me. There's Basil Rathbone, who plays Captain Levasseur. Our Lord Willoughby is that charming gentleman, Henry Stevenson. While Donald Chris, my fellow Londoner, who started his film career in the birth of a nation, is Colonel Bishop. And now, up goes our curtain as the Lux Radio Theater presents Captain Blood with Errol Flynn, Olivia de Havilland, Basil Rathbone, Henry Stevenson, and Donald Crisp. And here they are. England, in the year 1685. When James II ascended the throne, many of the common people of England rose in angry protest, only to be beaten into submission by the king's soldiers. Those rebels who survived the royal butchery were led to another certain death, a trial by a jury in Taunton Castle. We are in the great hall of the castle now. Among the five prisoners on trial is Peter Blood, a young Irish physician. Having no fear of God in your hearts, and being moved and seduced by the devil... 
to have stirred up war to depose said king. Therefore, you are here to be tried before a jury of your peers. The clerk will call the prisoners. Jeremy Pitt. Yeah. Hold up your hand. Are you guilty or not guilty? Guilty. John Wolverstone. Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Uriah Ogle. Guilty or not guilty? Guilty, praise be to God. Henry Hagthorpe. Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Peter Blood. Guilty or not guilty? It's entirely innocent I am. <laughs> Are you guilty or not guilty? You must say the right words. Words, is it? Speaking of words, I'd like to say a few about the injustice of keeping an innocent man locked up for three months in such filth and heat and ill-feeding that my chief regret is I did not try to pull down the filthy fellow that sits on the throne. Silence. Are you entirely ignorant of the proper procedure in court? I am most happily ignorant up to now. And I could gladly have done without this acquaintance. <laughs> Peter Blood, you were taken into custody at the same time as the other four prisoners. You were in their company on the night of the rebellion at Monmouth. Is that true? Yes, my lord. Then there is nothing more to be said except the passing of sentence. May it please your lordship, but there's a deal more to be said. I'm guilty of nothing, your lordship. Unless it's a judge the crime that a physician tried to save a man's life. What's this? Do you tell us you're a doctor, you rogue? I do, my lord. I was summoned on that night to the side of a dying rebel. I went and was surprised there with the other prisoners. A doctor? <laughs> Where are your witnesses? Jeremy Pitts, who summoned me. Oh, Master Pitt will testify. He that is himself a confessed traitor. <laughs> is that your witness? I can bring a hundred from the town in which I live. Have done with it. We have no time for all this. Gentlemen of the jury, inasmuch as Peter Blood has admitted aiding a traitor to your king, I hereby instruct you to return a verdict of guilty, that he may be justly punished for his treason. <laughs> so, <coughs> justice has come to that, has it? A man's to be hanged now for doing his duty. Huh? You will not be hanged. Master Blood. His Majesty has graciously commanded that in the future all convicted rebels are to be spared. They're to be sent to the colonies in the West Indies to be sold as slaves. <laughs> Clark, have the prisoners removed. They will sail to the Indies within the fortnight. <laughs> Be quiet, Jeremy Pitt. Keep a hold on yourself. Then the Lord arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Matthew chapter 8, verse 26. There'll be no calm upon this sea, Master Ogre, until we sight Port Royal. If ever we do sight it. Do you think we will, Peter Blood? I to our worst luck, Wolverton. It's the sun rages there, so I hear. Burns deep into a man's blood till the skin shrivels on his bones. Oh, God. What has happened to us, Peter? Oh, we're sweating the fields, Jeremy. First be bought and sold on the auction block like you'd haggle for a pig or a horse. Now count your teeth. Feel your muscles. Put a price on your head small enough to be an insult to a beast. <laughs> yes, it's a gay place, the auction block. A fine gay place. For Colonel Bishop. But Colonel Bishop is here now, Governor Steve. Here comes his carriage. Hmm? Oh, yes. He's brought his niece, I see. Charming girl. Oh. Good afternoon, Colonel Bishop. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Miss Arabella. How is my darling, the governor, this foot? Every day I'm sure my gout can't get any worse. And every day it does. You know, Let's get on with the sale, Your Excellency. No, of course. My dear Colonel. According to the king's request, it's for you to take first choice, and at your own price. He got that a weedy-looking lot. Not likely to be of much value on the plantation. The less you want, the more for Mr. Dixon. Dixon? 
Oh, Uncle, I wish you'd buy all the slaves. Buy them all? To keep them out of Dixon's hands. I've heard of those mines of his. And what have you heard? That they're wet, dark, evil holes. That men can't live there but die in agony of a horrible lung fever. You can't stand by and see men doomed to that, Uncle. Now, Stella, don't be childish. They should have been hanged, drawn, and quartered. Any fate they meet is too good for them. Start the sale. Here's the best of the lot, Colonel Bishop. <clears throat> His name is Wolverson. Healthy and strong. Open your mouth. Hmm. Good teeth. Fifteen pounds. Sold. Move along there. Next. Get up there, you. Ah, here we are. Here's another good one, Bishop. Piece of blood. Hmm, looks healthy enough. Open your mouth. Open yours and we'll compare them. I wager my gums are in finer shape. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this bag of impertinence? Eat your blood, sir. A doctor he is. Stand over here. Now. Open your mouth, you dog. If there's a dog here, let him show you his teeth. I'll show mine only to bite. <laughs> there's a rebellious rascal, Arabella. Good for him. He has pride, Governor. Not so good for him, evidently. His pride will purchase him a ticket for Dixon's mine. He isn't there yet. Auctioneer. Come, Miss Arabella. Let me speak to this prisoner. Speak to a dog. Arabella, get back to the carriage. Please, Uncle. Speak of blood. You're extremely foolish. You overwhelm me, my lady. It's fortunate for you that I'm here to save you. If you mean by that lofty speech that you persuade him to buy me, I'd thank you not to interfere. Would you? As it happens, you are hardly in a position to have anything to say about it. Uncle, will you buy him, please? Him, I will not. Let him cool his head in Dixon's mind. I'll have none of him. Uncle. I say no. Very well. Mr. Dixon, will you make a bid? I'll give five pounds to him. Five pounds? That's an insulting sum to offer. Well, does anyone ever more? I do. I'll give six pounds. Oh, oh, you I'll give eight. Arabella, you're making a spectacle of yourself. Let me be. Nine pounds. Nine pounds. Nine pounds, Miss Arabella. It's a big price to pay for such a silly fellow, but uh, ten pounds. <laughs> Go to Miss Arabella for ten pounds. Uh, what do you wish done with him, Miss Arabella? Oh, uh, well... Don't be hesitant, my lady. Speak up. You've paid for me. I trust you've learned your lesson in appreciation. You may join my uncle's slave. Thank you. Your very humble slave, my lady. Arabella, get back to the carriage. Governor Steed will take you to the house. Of course. Of course. This way, Miss Arabella. Bumpy roads. Mm. My foot's a bundle of fire. What does the doctor say, Governor? Say? He says nothing, of course. Well, then why not try someone else? Another doctor? There's only two in the whole blasted island, and each is worse than his partner. There is another now. Who? Peter Blood? Oh, a slave. Would you elevate a slave to be physician to the Governor? Well, why not? If he can help you, you can't tell. He may be very good. Mm. Well, it might be worth a try. I'll have him come and treat me for a while. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I'm just thinking how annoyed Peter Blood would be if he knew I'd just done him another favor. <laughs> Go on working. Don't look at me. I... I just come from the boat. It's hidden in South Cove at the end of the path. We'll make a break for it tonight. Tonight? Yes, till Wolverston, Ogle, and Hegthorpe and the others were in with us. It's a small boat for so many, Peter Blight. I'd looked it over well. I've been there all afternoon. It'll hold a lot of us. Are you still out of stores and equipment on board? Yes, there's enough for it. Careful. Let's listen. Peter Blood. Peter Blood, do you hear? I, when I'm addressed civilly, a taste of the lash might improve your hearing. Uncle, please. <laughs> Be quiet. Where have you been? I've been at my work, attending to the governor at his house. You lie. Why? The governor has had another attack of gout. He's been screaming for you like a wounded horse all afternoon. Well, then, it appears I was not at the governor's house. Where were you, then? Well, I was... He was with me, Uncle. Eh? What's that? 
thank you for protecting my reputation, Dr. Blood. But it was a useless gallantry. My uncle knows that I spend my time with whomever I please. You might choose your company with better taste. His Excellency is waiting for you, Blood. Travel better. I'm coming. Get on up to the house, Blood, and don't delay. Would you care to drive up, Dr. Blood? Well, I... Thank you. Drive on. <laughs> Bishop, I'd like to... You're very welcome, Dr. Blood. It seems that you're continually doing me favors. Faith, I don't know why. Neither do I. Yes, I do. It's because you're so very grateful and always thank me so prettily. Sure, now, you don't blame me for resenting you in your favors. This is interesting. I've had men tell me they have reasons for admiring me, and some few have even made claims to reasons for loving me. But for a man to store up reasons for resenting me... How refreshing. You must tell me a few of them. The first is reason enough. You bought me. I've had no lack of experiences in my life, but to be bought and sold was a new one. And I was in no mood to thank my purchaser. At any rate, I'm unable to stoop to lick up the scraps of favors tossed to me. I'm glad for that. Next. Well, I've resented you because your name's Bishop. My thoughts have lumped you with your uncle. How was I to know, be dead, that a devil can have a... But a devil can have an angel, a niece. I'm a resentful man. That is a pretty fair compliment. Have you any more reasons for resenting me like that one? Indeed I have, and the strongest of all. I've resented you because... Because I'm a slave and you're beautiful. Do you understand that? I... I don't know. If you were to explain further... No, I've already talked too much... Why did you lie to your uncle? Why did you tell him I was with you? Why? Dr. Blood, you're a physician and should know. Is it not considered unhealthy for a slave to be seen at a boat? At a boat? Why should it be? Boats put out to sea. Slaves may not. You're jumping at conclusions, aren't you? Why? This afternoon I happened to drive past the South Cove. Fortunately, I was alone at the time. I see. Miss Bishop, it's difficult for an Irishman to apologize, but I hope you can forgive me for having thought badly of you. I will. I will if you tell me what you think of me now. How I think of you? I think of you as... <laughs> Faith. I think of you as the woman who owns me, a slave. Oh. But I think the man is lucky who can count you his friend. I think you know you can. <gasps> what was that? It sounded like cannon. It was. Look at the men in the field. They're looking towards the bay. It must be... Wait. Can you see? Yes, there's a fleet sailing in. Spanish man of war. Spanish? Then it's an attack. A surprise attack. Quick, attacked. into the house. Where are you going? I've got to see the men. We've got to do it. Dr. Black, come back. Don't go down there. Please, let's see. I be the blood. Here, everyone. You want us to defend the bay? Defend the bay. Why, that we will. Listen, all of you. This is our, show, our chance to be drilled by a cannon. I can listen. I want you to gather all the slaves, as many as have a spark of courage, and follow me down to the water. What for? We need a boat, do we not? Aye. Then we'll have one. But none of your skulking little craft. We'll take a good one. A Spanish man of war. We'll board her under the fire from the other ships. Take them out of her. Turn our cannons on any Spanish boat that blocks our way to the sea. It's a long chance, friends, but with the help of God, we'll make it. Are you with me? Then come on, everyone. I say. Did you see that boat, Colonel Bishop? A Spanish man of war saved the town from destruction. A Spanish boat, but manned by Englishmen, I'll warrant. She sunk the rest of the Spanish fleet and holds the bay alone. It must be that some brave party of citizens got aboard that ship and have taken it captive. Gad, I think you're right. Someone should go aboard and congratulate them. Yes, yes, I... I'll have the longboat row me out. Oh. I'll not be long, Your Excellency. I hope your uncle does them full honor out there. They deserve it, Your Excellency. Whoever commanded that party was a brave man. A very brave man. I... I wonder who it could have been. I... Oh, 
Spanish man of war, ahoy! They don't answer, Colonel. Isn't that strange? I'll go aboard. Pull over there by the ladder. <coughs> Stand by the boat. I'll be down directly. Aye, sir. <coughs> ahoy, is anybody here? Welcome aboard our boat, Colonel Darwin. You? Why? Peter Blood. Was it you, then, who took this ship and turned defeat into victory? Myself, it was. Myself and these, my friends, and, uh, your friends. Uh, God, my life, it, uh, it was heroic. Heroic, is it? Hey, Dad, it was that <laughs> Well, you amaze me. Upon this soul, you amaze me. Blast me, you deserve well. You all deserve well, and you shall find me grateful. Uh, How grateful? Well, I'll, I'll ask His Excellency to write home to the king on account of your exploits. And maybe some portion of your sentence shall be remitted. The bug will be expected from you. <laughs> Colonel Darlin, such unusual generosity from you must be making you feel very ill. Now, as your position, I prescribe... Hang it! Ah, 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 no, Wait! We've done no hanging yet, men. Ogle, what do you suggest? So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready, men? No, no. And then the whale came and swallowed Jonah, I hope. <laughs> what now, Captain Blood? Captain, is it? Who be it, then? Now, Captain. Ace man to his post. Make ready for sea. Make ready for sea. Up into the south, men. Take the helm, Jeremy. Aye. What a name. We must have a new name for the boat. What name shall it be, Captain Blood? A new name, eh? Very well. We'll call her the Arabella. The Arabella it is. Our stars, Pearl Jim, and Olivia de Havilland are going on with Captain Blood in just a moment. Now, a short side trip to the home of a reporter from one of the famous movie magazines. This particular reporter has a new roommate from New York. Let's listen in. Ted, do me a favor, will you? Kind of look over this beauty article tonight. I walked the dressing rooms of every studio in Hollywood today to get the dope for it. Oh, why don't I get jobs like that? I've never been in a studio dressing room yet. Boy, I'll bet those screen stars have some plenty expensive beauty aids around. Upkeep on million-dollar complexions must be something. Hey, don't tell me it's news to you that screen stars use Lux toilet soap. Why, everybody knows that. But believe me, there's a lot in seeing it with your own eyes in the dressing rooms at RKO, Warner's, and all the rest. Of course, I've heard a lot about Lux Toilet Soap. And now that I've seen a lot of movie star complexions myself, I've decided I'll give it a whirl. That girl is in for a smooth complexion, the kind that screen stars have to have. Remember, when nine out of ten screen stars use Lux Toilet Soap, it's because this soap keeps skin smooth. Lux Toilet Soap guards against cosmetic skin. Its active lather removes the hidden traces of dust and dirt, stale rouge and powder that might remain to choke your pores. Before you put on fresh makeup, remove your stale makeup with Lux Toilet Soap. And be sure never to go to sleep at night without this important care. Lux Toilet Soap is a beauty soap thousands of happy girls are using. You'll like it, too. Once again, Herbert Marshall. On with the story of Captain Blood, starring Errol Flynn and Olivia de Havilland. There's Basil Rathbone, Henry Stevenson, and Donald Crisp. When Peter Blood and his men sail out of Port Royal, a price was set upon their heads. Unable to put into any civilized port, they took the only course open to them. They turned to piracy. With a ship, a handful of men, and a brain, Peter Blood carved out a crimson career in his new profession until his name became the terror of the Caribbean. Captain Blood! Captain Blood! Captain Blood! The Peter has taken I tell you, Peter Blood must die! Until his name became the pride and toast of every buccaneer. Peter an island off the coast of Haiti, was the one haven of refuge for pirate craft. 
Captain Blood and his men are there now, in an evil-smelling tavern, dimly lit by hanging lanterns, crowded with drunken, leering buccaneers. Be there. Come on, lad, join with me on this. It is as I tell you, Mount Captain Blood. What a pair we would make in all the Caribbean there is no buccaneer so strong as me. Except you. You almost flatter me, Levisel. <laughs> then why you hold off so long your consent we become partners, huh? Here you have been in Tortuga these three, four months. You must be even so much in need of gold as I. Uh, such a partnership requires sober thought. My poor brain has been dancing with rum this whole week, class. <laughs> even so drunk, your brain is the greatest, huh? With your brain and my strength, oh, monsieur le capitaine, what? There is nothing we cannot do. Be dead, there's very little I can't do entirely without you. <laughs> <laughs> my men are much in favor of the partnership. That is so, men. <laughs> and my men. I'll leave it to them. Are you in favor? I don't. Very well, then. It's done. But wait, Lever, sir. It's understood, is it not? That we sail under my articles. It is. But uh, <laughs> I do not like so very much your so strict rules about women. No women to be taken as prisoners. Agreed? Uh, may we? To get you as a partner, mon Capitan, I would agree to anything. <laughs> no. What is the first order, Mon Capitan Park? We sail with the tide. Outside the harbor, we'll scatter. Each ship will proceed singly in order to pick up what stray prizes we may run into on the journey. We'll converge at the island of Virgin Magra. Magnifique, I give you the toast. To our so great success. Let me give one to the greatest captain on the coast. Captain Blood. Here, Captain Blood. Here, here. Captain Blood. <laughs> The lookout, Mon Capitan, an English vessel of our port. We are lucky, yes. Just as I am about to give up and anchor to wait for my partner, Captain Blood, this very fine English prize walked right into my parlor and said, Bonjour, Le Vasseur. <laughs> we go to give welcome, Kaubusak, huh? <laughs> oui, Mon Capitan. Run up the Spanish flag. We must take them by surprise. Run up the Spanish flag! The lookout says. Do you see it, Lord Willoughby? Aye, there it is, Miss Arabella. Oh, yes. I wonder if she's going to Port Royal, too. Have you been away long, Miss Arabella? Almost six months. A kind of vacation. Are you glad to get back? In a way, I suppose I would have stayed longer in England if my uncle hadn't sent for me. He's been made governor, you know. Yes, I've heard. It's natural that he should want his niece back again. One needs a woman to brighten up social occasions, mm. especially when the woman in question is so very charming. Ah, however else things change, Lord Willoughby, the art of flattery still flourishes. Stab me if it's flattery. When the king ordered me on this journey as a special emissary to the West Indies, I looked forward with some trepidation to a life among the savages. <laughs> when I came aboard and found that you were one of those savages returning home to her native heath, my grateful eyes couldn't believe it. Ah, you pictured us running around with animal skins, eating raw meat? Why not? In a country filled with Indians, Africans, and pirates. Oh, well, speaking of pirates, uh, did you ever happen to hear of a wild rogue named Peter Blood? Peter Blood? Yes. No. I don't know him. I, I hardly number pirates among my acquaintances. Oh, no, of course not. Silly of me. I only mentioned him in passing because he happens to touch on the business of my mission. Your mission? Yes. I'm sent to attempt to blot out all this piracy, my dear, in a manner which I must keep secret until I can find Captain Blood. Oh, you're looking for him. Aye. Look, stab me if that Spanish vessel isn't cutting clean across our bow. Captain Hall! Captain! Yes, Your Lordship? 
What ship is that, you know? Well, I've been watching her, your lordship. She flies a Spanish flag. But she could be anything in these waters. We're in pirate waters now, aren't we? Yes, my lord. Yonder bank of low clouds is the island of Virgin Margaret. Exciting, isn't it, Miss Arabella? Mm. Could she be a pirate ship by any chance, Captain? Well, any ship we meet in the Caribbean could be a pirate ship. You know, I wouldn't trust. Ah! She fired across our bow. All hands on deck! All hands on deck! She is a pirate ship! And the talent! Get below, Miss Arabella. The captain's going to fight it out. But you should have known better. Stand the prisoners before me, Kahuzak. Wait. Stand here, my lord, will you be? And uh, you here, madam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my friends, uh, this pleasant strip of beach on which we find ourselves is the island of Virgin Magra. No boats ever put in here except mine. And one other. So you may put aside any hope of rescue that may be in your mind. <laughs> The ransom for you two, Lord Willoughby and the, uh, the so charming lady, is fixed at 20,000 pieces of eight, and I shall provide a boat for you to go to Governor Bishop at Port Royal to collect it, Lord Willoughby. Meanwhile, Mademoiselle remains with me as hostage. Ah, I find it very lonely on this island. I refuse. Absolutely and utterly. My friend, do you see this knotted cord? It is capable to screw a man's eyes out of his head. Very well. Do your worst. Lord Willoughby, thank you, but don't be foolish. You can't fight against them. Mademoiselle is right. I beg you to spare yourself, monsieur. And the young lady. Ah, I have been too modest. But since I have stayed 20,000 pieces of eight, I have stayed 20,000 pieces of eight. And for what, if you please? Ah. Uh, 20,000 pieces of eight. Good morning, never, sir. Oh, oh, oh. Captain Blood, I did not know you were on the island. Oh, yes. We arrived late last night and put into a cove a few miles to the west. We've walked across to give you a good day, but faith, I seem to have interrupted some little business of yours. Who are these people? Yes, Miss O. Look, Captain. Why, She's the girl who... You recognize the prisoner, Captain Blood? Why, no. Who are they? Well, I have captured them. A titled Englishman at the knees of the governor of Jamaica. Really? Then I suppose congratulations were in order. But had you forgotten there is an article in our agreement forbidding the taking of women prisoners? <laughs> ah, that's so foolish article of yours. I was not aware you regarded it so when you signed. Would you care to dispute my opinion now? Your men against mine. No. No, not this morning, thank you. As you say, a foolish article. <laughs> that is why these prisoners are not my own. And not to personal. And the 20,000 pieces of eight or so? And not to personal. Whatever valuables come into our possession are the joint property of all our company. Ho, oh, oh. ho! Then it is I should cut the prisoners up in so many little pieces and pass them around, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Obviously, these prisoners, and especially the young lady, must be kept in someone's hands for, shall we say, safekeeping. But why your hands? Why shouldn't Pierre have her? We, I should have her. Or Ralph, or Jacob. Since she's as much their property as yours. Come here, girl. Here, I say. What do you want with me? I want to look at you. Mm hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Be dead if I blame you, Lena, sir. A trifle skinny, perhaps. Put an attractive baggage at that. <laughs> And now, my captain, since you covet what is our joint property of war, you may have her, providing you're willing to buy her. Buy her? Yes, at the price you yourself have set upon her. 20,000 pieces of eight. That is right, mon capitaine. It is reasonable. It is in the article. What is in the articles, you fool? Where do you suppose I have 20,000 pieces of eight? Then let someone buy her who has. Who? I. You. I don't wish to be bought by you. Well... Someone once told a slave it uh, happens that you are hardly in a position to have anything to say about it. You, you want to go? Yes, why not? I'm willing to pay for what I want. There's your answer. And now, Mademoiselle, if you please. No! Let go of that girl. Capitaine, never sure. Do not. It is honorably checked. It is not settled to me. 
Here, not take a while I live. Smoke. Quick, sir, I'll take him on your desk. Put on your sword. Uh, two breaches now, I'll go. Committed by you. This will be room. What's that? What's that? What I intended for you, man. But since you prefer it this way, I'm not great. Wait, sir, be human. He's a close guard, never, sir. Put your own mark. Happy time. That's my friend and the partnership which should never have begun. Robertson. I'm... We're leaving. Take the girl. What are you going to do with me? What are you... Why... Where are you taking me? I've not decided as yet. I'll go to Port Royal or nowhere. Will you now? You'll find you'll do as I say. What right have you to treat me this way? Right. The right of possession. Robertson. I'm... You may take my property aboard ship. <laughs> For station identification, this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> Olivia de Havilland and Errol Flynn resume the events of our play shortly. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we leave the treasure hunting pirates of the 17th century for a treasure hunter of today, Mr. Charles Courtney, the world's greatest locksmith. His uncanny ability to find the combination has carried him all over the world led him to save innumerable lives and risk his own as many times, and recover in all over $50 million in treasures lost on land and sea. The Lux Radio Theater extends its stage from Hollywood to New York, where we welcome the world's greatest safe cracker. Mr. Charles Courtney now speaks to you from New York. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Captain Blood took his treasure from ships that sailed on the seas. I find my treasures on ships beneath the seas. The worst fight I ever had, and one that almost cost me my life, was in the North Sea. We were trying to recover the $50 million that sank with Lord Kitchener's ship, the Hampshire. Working at a depth of 350 feet below the sea, we had opened one safe. Then, while working on another, we opened a door. As soon as it opened, I was slammed against a bulkhead. I signaled the men above to hold me up, but the telephone line was broken. I couldn't move, and the pressure got stronger. I knew then that I was trapped by a diver's worst enemy, a cross current. They tell me it took an hour before they could get me up. No one will ever go down there again, for the English government has consecrated the Hampshire as Lord Kitchener's tomb. I have had exciting experiences on land. Once, I had to pick the lock of a burning apartment with a fork and a knife to rescue a woman and three children. Picking locks and hunting for treasure have carried me into many countries and many tight spots. But as this is the Lux show, Mr. Marshall, this will interest you. No matter what part of the world I'm in, I never have to hunt for luck soap. You can find it everywhere. I know Mr. Marshall for my wife and my 18-year-old daughter that luck soap is important to the ladies for complexion. But I'd really like to say something for a, from a man's angle. I use it regularly for the bad. Believe me, there have been plenty of times in my life when a good hot tub and a cake of luck soap felt mighty good to me. My trade has had its amusing side, too. One thing I always like to remember is one of my contacts with the police department. A patrol wagon appeared at the door of my shop one day, filled with prisoners. The officer in charge had lost his key, so he asked me if I would pick the lock of the wagon door so he could let the prisoners out to lock them up again in jail. Thank you, Mr. Courtney. Back to Hollywood now, where we continue with Captain Blood, starring Errol Flynn and Olivia de Havilland, with Basil Rathbone, Henry Stevenson, and Donald Crisp. <laughs> Captain Blood's unchivalrous actions toward Arabella were prompted by necessity to safeguard her from the men. 
Now in his cabin on board the boat, he expresses his true feelings. He paces the floor exultantly as Arabella sits watching him. Arabella. Arabella, to think that you're really here. Here in the cabin of this ship, which I named for you. I dared to hope that someday you'd be here. To gather all these precious things I have for you. See, Arabella? Anchor rings from Persia. And look. Red jewel slippers. Long golden chains. And this dress, Arabella. This blue dress. When I saw it, I thought of your eyes. And I knew it was made for you to wear. I'll never wear it. Nor any plunder gotten by a thief and pirate. Thief and pirate? Thief and pirate. Arabella, you... I've seen your pirate ways. I've seen myself bargain for and fought over a combat between jackals. I thought you understood. You mean you thought you'd bought me. I suppose I should have regarded that as a compliment. You pirates are used to taking what you want without the formality of purchase. I advise you to go back to your ladies at Tortuga, Captain Blood. To your ladies who are thrilled by your bold, lawless ways. I only hate you and despise you. I might have expected your thanks for what I've done this day, but... Very well, let it be so. I'm thief and pirate, and I'll show you how a thief and a pirate can deal. Once you bought me for ten measly pounds. Now I bought you for considerably more. The amounts of no matter. What matters is that now I own you as you once owned me. You're mine, do you understand? Mine to do with as I please. Yes, sir, sir. Well? Lord Willoughby sends his compliments and requests that you talk to him at your earliest convenience. He sent out by the king himself. You can return his compliments and tell him to go to the devil. I'm not convenient to any friend of the king. All right, sir. Oh, wait. I'm going on deck. Jeremy, take this lady to her cabin and see that she stays there. All right, look. How you hate the fellow. If, if I were a young man, blast me if I wouldn't be jealous. And you said you didn't even know him. He was once my slave. Your slave? Then you must have known him well. I did. He doesn't seem such a, such a bad fellow for a pirate. In those days, I thought him an unfortunate gentleman who had suffered a great injustice. When he made his escape, I was thrilled and happy. That was before I knew how he would use his freedom. Not to argue with you, my dear, but how else could he have used his freedom? An escaped slave, a homeless convict. And aren't you forgetting that a man's bitter heart may demand its revenge? That's the unforgivable thing, to have held his revenge above all else and so to have destroyed himself, for he has. I've seen pirates, I know what they are. Cruel, evil, greedy, plundering peaceful cities, torturing their captives. Beasts out of hell they are. Hmm. Are you so much in love with him? In love with him? To care so much what he does? I don't care in the least what he does. Someone should for what he's doing now. Still, your uncle commands a fleet at Port Royal. That much is fortunate. Why? What's this about Port Royal and my uncle? He amazes me, this Peter Blood. That's where he means to take us. No, he can't. I'm afraid he can if he wants to. They won't let me near him. He's alone on his quarter deck in a fine Irish temper, I expect. But I learned from the pilot... Lord Willoughby, he mustn't. Mustn't take you to your home? To your uncle? He has no more bitter enemy in the world. My uncle is a hard, unforgiving man. He lives in the hope of one day taking and hanging Captain Blood. Captain Blood probably doesn't know that, of course. I doubt it would make any difference if he did. He's chivalrous to the point of idiocy. And yet he's been what he has been these last three years. And done what he's done. Oh, Lord Willoughby, help me. I see your point, my child. But it's something you'll have to decide for yourself. Life can be infernally complex. <laughs> Port Royal, 
Well, then, but who? Fire craft, perhaps. I wish I could make out their flags. Captain Blood. I? For days I've been trying to see you, Captain. And now, if I may speak to so inaccessible a person, perhaps I can supply you the answer. You can? If Port Royal is attacked, they are likely French ships. French? Why French ships? When two countries are at war and one is attacked, who would it be but the enemy? England and France at war? You mean you didn't know? Where have you been the past two months? At sea, out of touch with the world. Uh-oh! that's supposed to protect the town. I can supply the answer to that. It's out chasing pirates. Bishop wouldn't let his fleet leave its post in time of war. He wouldn't dare. No? <laughs> Colonel Bishop is a very old, and I may say a very dear friend of mine. It's probably me who's out there. A fool plunker. <laughs> <laughs> and me and his own front yard. <laughs> hard aboard to the helm, Jeremy. Aye. Helmsman, hard aboard! Aye, sir! May I ask, Captain, what are your intentions? I set out to land you at Port Royal, Your Lordship, with some risk to myself from the English fleet. Now a stroke of luck has removed them from the picture. Well, we'd best be turning back. Can you, an Englishman, be thinking of leaving when yonder an English town is being taken? Well, of what should we be thinking? Of the honor to fight for your king. To fight for my king, is it? <laughs> Do you hear that, lad? <laughs> the honor, is it? It's not a word to use in the same breath with him, and furthermore, he's not my king. Then you fail to show him the same loyalty he shows you. Loyalty now? Honor and loyalty. Fine words to describe him. He was loyal enough to send me to seek you out, to offer you pardon for your past crimes, freedom from your slavery, and more than that, a commission in his own navy for you and your men. What? The king wants us to join his navy? You can read the document for yourself, Captain Dutton. <coughs> I wouldn't soil my hands with him. I'd rock it for life, sir. <laughs> However you hate the king, England is still England. And a bad king's a bad king. And if it's James, he's worse. Really? This commission is sent by King William. King William? Who may be King William? I allude to his majesty, King William III, William of Orange, who with Queen Mary has come over from the Netherlands and has been ruling England these past two months or more. You mean they, they've roused themselves at home and kicked out James? Yes, and he's fled to France and he's hiding there. And therefore, England and France are at war. And King William sent us this commission? He did. He knows that you are good men, wrongfully sold into slavery. He can use good men in his navy. I, uh, why didn't you tell me that at once? Men, I, uh, you've heard the news. For me, this changes the shape of the world. For you who are slaves with me... It means that we're no longer slaves, but once more have a home and a country. For you who are English, it means a chance to fight for your native land. For I now propose to sail into Port Royal and save it from the French. Those of you who are not Englishmen, you'll have to be content with fighting for Captain Blood. And for the loot you'll find on the French ship. Are you willing to fight, men? Then to your posts, don't the hard about. Full sail and straight ahead for Port Royal. seen victory so gallantly set from defeat. Yeah, it was a good fight. But Miss Bishop, where is she? Is she safe? Safe and sound. You'll find her now at the governor's mansion. That is, if you're looking for her. Looking for her? Aye, there I am. Good evening. Peter I thought you'd gone. But faith, I've only just arrived. But you can't stay here. My uncle just returned. Yes, I know. You know? Well, what are you going to do? Just stay here. Oh, no, no, no. It's impossible. You mustn't stay here. He's sworn he'll hang you. Well, I doubt it'd be well. I've always been bad luck for your uncle. But you can't know the threats he's made. His whole life is spent in searching for you. Well, now he's found me. 
Well, you can still save yourself. Please, please, for my sake. For your sake? I'll hide you. What do you mean, for your sake? Isn't it true that you hate me? Hate you? Or is it that you love me? I'll hide you, and tonight when it's dark, I'll find someone. You love me, don't you? Don't you? Whom else would I love? You love me. Yes. Now will you go? I have better. Please. He'll be here any minute. I'll hide you somewhere and... We'll hide together. I know just the place. Where? Here. Peter, this is my uncle's office. The office of the governor. Good. Well, he'll come here first. Oh, I forgot to tell you. The governor and I are on the best of terms now. The very best of terms. Sometimes I think I'm the best friend he has in the world. When did you find out you love me? Oh, you must be mad. He's a nice man, the governor, you know. He lets me come and go here as I please. In fact, look, he even lets me sit in his chair. See? Listen. My uncle, he's coming through the street now. They're cheering him. Cheering, is it? That's a strange kind of cheering, I'm thinking. Take your hands off me, you rogue. I have arrested you by order of His Excellency the Governor. The Governor? You're mad. I am the Governor. You mean you were the Governor. But you've changed that in your absence. Bishop, you're removed from office for abandoning your post in time of war. Who the devil are you? My name is Willoughby. I'm a special emissary from His Majesty the King. Lord Willoughby? You were informed, I think, of my coming. Oh, yes, yes. And yet you went off on some wild goose chase after a pirate, leaving your capital at the mercy of the enemy. It's a serious matter, Colonel Bishop, as you may find. But your lordship... I'm not concerned to hear your reasons, man. His Excellency the Governor will hear you. The Governor? You'll find him inside the house. It rests entirely with him, whether you're hanged or not. This is one more item to the account of that scoundrel blood. Why, heaven, what a wrecking they'll be when we meet you. Oh, come in, Uncle. Arabella, what are you doing in this office? I've been pleading with the governor on your behalf, asking him to be as merciful as you would be cruel. The governor? Where is he? I, I fear I am, Colonel Darwin. Peter Blood, you? I? The new governor, by the king's order. Well, and by my order, I command that for your neglect of duty... No, no, in heaven's name, Blood. That for your neglect of duty, you ought to be punished. By accepting his nephew, one Peter Blood, one-time pirate. What? Arabella, may I put my arm about you? If you wish. Oh, Faith, <laughs> you're as pretty as a Mayday sky. Wait, I, 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 don't, I don't understand this. You don't need to understand, Uncle... You're excused. And so we bring down our curtain on Captain Blood, but not on Errol Finn and Olivia de Havilland, who will return to us in a few moments. Douglas McCain is one of the four or five major stars of silent days still most prominently identified with films. He starred in such pictures as The Hottentot, Seven Keys to Ball Pit, and Twenty Three and a Half Hours Leave. Then he turned producer, sponsoring So Red the Rose, Accent on Youth, and Mrs. Wiggs of the Cabbage Patch, to name a few. Today he's head of Douglas McLean Productions, whose pictures are released by Grand National, the most recent of which is Great Guy, starring James Cagney. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Douglas McLean. Thank you, Bart. Isn't it true, Doug, that some eight years ago you retired from pictures? But here you are, still in the midst of them. Yes, I tried retirement for a while, but I discovered there's too much celluloid in my system to swear off completely. And now, with great guy under your belt, I understand you're hard at work on a new version of 23 and a half hours leave. But who's going to play the part that you made so famous? Sergeant Gray. James Ellison, the young actor who did such a splendid uh, job in Mr. DeMille's Plainsman. And Jimmy is giving an excellent performance in 23 and a half hours' leave, a part which offers him his greatest opportunity. Remaking this film must bring back many memories of Hollywood of the old days. Things must have changed tremendously. Yes, everything has changed, including the weather. Today, Hollywood Boulevard is one of the busiest streets on the West Coast. But I recall a conversation with Charlie Chaplin, who stood on one side of the boulevard and I on the other, calmly discussing our new pictures. Interesting, but how could you hear each other with all the traffic noise? Well, the only noise then was the sound of oranges growing in the groves that lined the boulevard. In those days, western pictures were at their height, and cowboy actors would spend the morning being photographed on horseback, chasing invisible Indians or shooting them from behind rocks and trees, 
But then after lunch, these same actors would be dressed and painted as Indians. And they'd be filmed running away from invisible cowboys. When the picture was screened, it was not unusual for the same actor dressed as the cowboy to shoot himself dressed as the Indian. Actors were very versatile in those days. You've been in pictures for 20 years, Doug. But no one would believe it, judging from your looks. Pardon me, did you say uh, looks or lux? Oh, good going. And since we're on the subject of lux soap, why not a word about what Hollywood studios think about it? I'll do better than that, Bart. I'll say two words. It's tops. Thank you. And now, from your experience as an actor, director, writer, and producer, what's your opinion of radio in Hollywood? Well, radio has probably become the biggest asset to motion pictures in the past year or so. I believe each helps the other, so long as entertainment maintains the standards set by the Lux Radio Theater. In the silent days, actors like polite little boys and girls were seen but not heard. But now you hear them whether you see them or not. Thank you. Bye, Dad. As a consistent Lux listener, I know this is the time when Mr. DeMille calls forth the stars to shine again, and so shall I. Ladies and gentlemen, Errol Flynn and Olivia de Havilland. Thank you, Mr. Marshall, for a most enjoyable evening. Nowadays, we're all inclined to look upon a life as adventurous as that of Captain Blood as being entirely to the romantic past. But our friend, Mr. Flynn, can put some of those old timers to shame. And what have you to say to that, Errol? Well, life is still rather primitive over there in New Guinea. I spent six years in the islands, first as a patrol officer of the constabulary. If you can picture me as a cop, you'll realize about how primitive the place must have been. And what happened after that, Constable Flynn? Well, I grew a beard and became a beachcomber. When I got tired of combing the beach and the beard, I traded a bit in pearls. After that, I got hold of a schooner and went in the copper business. Errol wouldn't tell you that he's written a book about another voyage he made, but he has. It's called Bean Ends. It's just been published, and a very fine book it is. Errol, you're leaving tonight on a new trip, aren't you? Yes. I'm flying to New York in an hour, and then I sail for Europe. I hope to get a look at the Spanish War, and on the way home, perhaps uh, spend a few weeks in South America. But uh, that's enough, I think. How about you, Olivia? Well, after working in two pictures with me, Errol, you should know what a singularly uneventful life I lead. But it's a very happy one. And I'm looking forward to making a picture soon with Leslie Howard. And then next summer, if things turn out as I hope they will, I plan to spend three whole months touring the country in an automobile and rarely seeing what the United States look like. And now, before I say goodbye... I'd like to congratulate the sponsors of this program for their marvelous product, Lux Toilet Soap. It's the finest complexion care I know of, and whenever girls ask my advice, I always recommend it. Thank you. Goodbye, Bart. Many thanks. You both of you all the luck in the world. Thank you, Mr. Haviland, Mr. Flynn, and Mr. Marshall. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your announcer, Mel Del Roach. Before Mr. Marshall tells us of next week's program, may I say that Mr. Flynn, Mr. Haviland, Mr. Rathbone, and Mr. Crisp appeared to courtesy of Warner Brothers, Mr. Marshall, RKO, and Columbia Studios, and will next be seen with Marlena Dietrich in The Angel. Mr. Silvers is from 20th Century Fox, where he was in charge of music for the new film, Love is News. And now, Herbert Marshall. Next Monday night, when you and I tune in the Lux Radio Theater, we'll find Cecil B. DeMille resuming his regular place at the helm, bringing us a star and story warm to our hearts. The star will be Peter B. Kind's Cathy Ricks. In the title role, one of the finest character actors of the stage, screen, and radio. A man beloved by millions throughout the country. Ladies and gentlemen, Charles Winninger. And with Mr. Winninger, Richard Allen and Sally Eilers. And now I join the makers of Lux Toilet Soap in inviting you to listen in again next Monday night. When the Lux Radio Theater, here in Hollywood, presents Charles Winninger, Richard Allen, and Sally Eilers in Cathy Ricks. With Cecil B. DeMille back again as producer. This is Herbert Marshall, bidding you all good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.